So in this video, I want to talk about SN2 electrophile requirements. And so since SN2 reactions are essentially a direct substitution mechanism, which means that it occurs by one step, the electrophilic carbon must be sterically accessible to the nucleophile. And essentially what that means is the nucleophile has to be able to get into contact with the electrophilic carbon. Like, the less stuff that's in the way, the better it will be. So, stuff means anything, really. Like, it mostly refers to the bulk on the carbon. So, how much or how many atoms that carbon is bonded to. And so I think it would be better if I explained it using, yeah, using an example. So let me draw something out. So below, I've drawn, I've drawn four different molecules. And so as you can tell, the main difference between all of these is the number of methyl groups, or CH3s, attached to the middle carbon. And we're going to, this middle carbon, so let me just circle, you know what, I'll draw it in red. So the red carbons are the electrophilic carbons that the nucleophile is going to attack. And so the only difference is the number of methyl groups on the carbons. And so, as you can imagine, CH3s, or methyl groups, are a lot bigger than hydrogens. And so, if a nucleophile were to try to come in and attack any of these carbons, for example, it would be a lot harder if there was a lot more stuff in the way. And by that, I mean atoms, like uh, methyl groups, since they're bigger. So, the more methyl groups that the carbon has attached to it, the harder it is for the nucleophile to access the electrophilic carbon. And so as a result, the rate is going to slow with increasing amount of methyl groups. And so we're going to rank the rate. And so this rate right here would be the highest. I'll do that in blue. So that would occur the fastest. And then so on. And here it would occur the slowest. And it would have the slowest rate because the electrophilic carbon is not as accessible and so the reaction will not occur as often. And one thing to remember though, for the slowest one with the this molecule right here is a tertiary carbon. So the electrophilic carbon is tertiary. And so tertiary carbons will not undergo SN2. And so that's going to be really important to remember in the future when you have to determine whether a reaction occurred by SN1, SN2, E1, and so on. And one thing I kind of forgot to mention, um, the electrophilic carbon is generally referred to as the alpha carbon. So that carbon is generally referred to as the alpha carbon. And then carbons next to it are referred to as beta carbons. So those are alpha carbons. Next, we're going to talk about beta branching. So, um, depending on what the beta carbon is bonded to, it can also influence the rate of reactions. So, let me draw it out. And so here we have four different molecules. And I've drawn them this way just because it's easier. Remember, the, there are a lot of implied hydrogens on the bonds. And so I'm going to designate the alpha and beta carbons. And so I've designated the alpha carbons in red and the beta carbons in blue. And so as you can see, the main difference between these, once again, 
is the number of methyl groups bonded to the beta carbons. So, if you look at the differences, it's just simply the number of methyl groups bonded to the beta carbons. And so, just as alpha carbons can be sterically hindered, beta carbons, beta branching, can also affect the rate of the reaction. And so, what you need to remember is that the more beta branching there is, the slower the reaction will occur for SN2 mechanisms. And that's once again because of steric hindrance. And so if we were to rank it again, going from fastest to slowest, so this reaction would occur fastest, and then this would occur second fastest, third fastest, and this would be the slowest or fourth fastest in this instance. However, so that essentially sums it up for beta branching. It's the same thing as alpha branching. But what you might ask is, well, what happens if you get to the next carbon? Like, for example, what happens if this carbon right there has a lot of... Um, stuff bonded to it. Well, beyond the beta carbon, it really doesn't matter. So whatever this carbon is bonded to right here is not going to influence the rate of the SN2 reaction. And so quite simply, you need to worry about alpha carbons first, and then if the alpha carbons are the same, you look at the beta carbons to determine whether something's more reactive than another. And anything beyond that, you don't even need to look at because it's not going to influence the rate of reaction for an SN2 mechanism.